Welcome to Wildly Wealthy Life, the show that's all about exploring the different paths to a life of freedom and fulfillment and how that ripples through your personal life, family life, and to the community. Join husband and wife power couple Lee and Kat Hughes as they share people's stories from different backgrounds and lifestyles about what it means to live a life well lived. Tune in and take that first step to becoming the best version of yourself, personally and professionally, here on Wildly Wealthy Life. One of my blogs that I like to read, and he's got millionaire profiles, but what I like most about the blog is the title, ESI Money, because he he gets right to it. Earn, save, and invest. Mm -hmm. That that is the magic formula. And if you're not doing all three of those things, it's not enough. You have to obviously go out and earn money. Most Mm -hmm. people do that. Save money? Mm, Well, yeah, you got to save it, but that's not the end of the story because you can't just park it in a bank account and get, what, 0.1%. That's not going to make you wealthy. (laughs) And then investing, you've got to invest that money, whether it be you know, in mutual funds, the stock market, real estate. There are many ways to skin that cat, but you, you, know, you need to understand how to invest. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Wildly Wealthy Life Podcast. This is Lee, and here is my lovely wife, Kat, and co-host. Uh, Kat, who do we have on today? Today, we have Jerry Bourne, a.k.a. the Millionaire Educator. He is a teacher, and it wasn't until in his 30s that he started the path towards financial independence. I really love his story and his journey, and just excited to chat with him about that today. So, Jerry, hello. Hey, how y'all doing? Thanks for uh, having me. (laughs) We are doing good. Uh, Jerry, can you tell us a little bit about you, a little bit more, like what you do, um, and what, you know, drove you to financial independence? Well, I'm a public school teacher. I teach Spanish primarily and ESOL. And um, I'm also a basketball coach. Um, I went to college at Davidson College where I I played basketball and I had an athletic scholarship. And uh, from there, I ended up in South America, well, Argentina and El Salvador. And that's where I learned Spanish. Uh Um, And I eventually became a Spanish teacher from that. Um, I was not planning on being a teacher, much less a Spanish teacher. And um, I started back in 1992, and I think my first year I made $18,000, and it, you know, there was not a lot of money in public school teaching back mm-hmm. then, and that's Georgia, which is a, you know, not a, a union state, it's a right-to-work state, so, you know, te- uh, teaching salaries are a little lower, but um, anyway, I did that for a few years and decided to go to grad school, and I went off, and I, and, and if anybody's heard this before, I apologize, but did an MBA and a master's for Spanish education. And, and uh, from there, I thought I was going to use my MBA, but um, I, I, I just couldn't give up the free time. I'll be honest, you know, the, the summers and the breaks. And I act, ended up taking a, a job in Saudi Arabia. And from there, I started learning a little bit about money, really. Like, um, I, I guess, you know, I never had money before, so I didn't know anything about money management. Well, all of a sudden, I was paying down my, my student loan debt. And then I, I had money and I was like, what am I going to do? You know, I had 3000 bucks and I had 5,000. And then I got serious about money. And, um, from there, I, I just started, uh, I built a net worth of a hundred thousand dollars. My, my wife came to Saudi Arabia and lived with, with, with me. And, uh, uh, she taught at a local, uh, international school. And when we left there in 2001, we had a hundred thousand or 110,000. I can't remember. And my records are a disaster, so there's no way we'll ever know. Um, <laughs> zero debt and a hundred to one hundred ten thousand dollars, and that's really where my story kicks off. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I don't want to just gloss that over because, you know, at that point I was not a young person. I was thirty-eight when I came back, mm-hmm. right? So, um, yeah, I, I thirty-eight. I get back and then I'm public school teaching in Georgia, and I've got a leg up in the sense that I don't have any debt. And um, then I started learning about, you know, how to save money in America. You know, uh, prior to that, I was just kind of uh, putting everything in a, in a Vanguard account. Mm-hmm. And I had a small 401k with my employer, which was a U.S. firm. But anyway, uh, that's where it got interesting to me because I, I realized, wow, uh, we could use all our tax advantage buckets, namely the 403b and the IRA. That's what I started using. And my wife and I, since 2000, 
And three, every year we have maxed out our 403B and our IRA. Awesome. And down the road, we learned about a 457, a deferred comp plan, which is essentially, it's like a second 401k plan. Well, we got to where we had, uh, we started filling that bucket as well. So, you know, as a working class person, you know, I'm not from upper crust, uh, trust fund baby or anything like that. So when I realized that we could save 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars a year, I was, that's big money to me. And, and we've just been saving ever uh, aggressively ever since we started public school teaching here. Uh, to give you an idea, the range is 2003, I think we saved $30,000. And then this past year, 2019, we saved over $130,000. Wow. Ooh, amazing. Yeah. Would you, um, sorry, would you kind of just get, go back a little, real quick, just for our listeners, can you just quickly explain net worth? Yeah, net worth would just be um, your assets minus your liabilities. So, for mm -hmm. example, your assets would be, um, I include like my retirement accounts. Mm -hmm. um, any, any savings, checking accounts. Um, if I had like a mutual fund with someone, um, my house, so I have a modest house here, $70,000 house, three, two brick. I got, you guys are over there in the West coast. I got to lay it on you. Three, two brick, 1600 square feet. I paid 68,000 bucks for it. Yeesh. Only owned <laughs> by one family. Wow. It, yeah. You got a, about a 10 foot square patch out in the front. That might be that much <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. sorry it's, i couldn't help yeah, I had to rub it's it crazy out here. yeah <laughs> so um so you know you add up all the things that you own um and that let's just say call those your assets and then the things that you owe so mm -hmm. if on your house you know it was a hundred thousand dollar home and you you paid off half of it fifty thousand of that would be asset and fifty would be a uh, debt but um i basically um net worth you know you you just subtract debts from assets and that gives you net worth. And I like that um, you are focused on that because uh, some of our different guests have been talking about like cash flows and um, not really talking about like the debt to, to asset ratios and whatnot. Um, what, what, what was it about net worth that kind of caught your, your heart, your, your ideas? Well, I, I, well, that's a good question. I've never really thought of that. I, I started blogging, I guess, in 2007. Mm -hmm. And I just, all I was doing was just tracking my net worth. And I, I guess I figured that was like a scorecard. Yeah. You no, know? because as you know, there's a lot of people who earn good money and they don't save their money in their, in their accounts. And they don't really know what their net worth is. And I think you should always know what your net worth is because mm -hmm. it, it's like, you know, um, it's like keeping a track of your weight. You know, I don't like focus on it 24 seven, but it's good to know, knows, you know, where you are. Um, but yeah, and I can understand why people might want to track cash flow. I mm -hmm. mean, because that could give you, you know, if you, you've got a big enough buffer on cash flow, you could be fired in a sense that you, you can, you know, let that fund it. So, right, right. Yeah. It just turns out that I started doing net worth years ago and that's what I've tracked. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a good measure. I, I recommend everyone do it. Yeah. As, when you were in uh, Saudi Arabia, that's when you realized you had that 100000 Or is it when you first came back? Um, I, I knew pretty much that I had 100000 and um, And about, about 30 of that, I believe, was um, my 401k. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then I had maybe $80,000 in uh, my Vanguard account. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it, I felt like it was so much money. Cause I never really had any and I didn't have any debt, which, you know, that is kind of like the, another, uh, the flip side of wealth that we don't have a lot of debt, mm -hmm. man. And, and you've, and you're frugal anyway, mm -hmm. you, you've got a lot of options and I felt really free and it made me feel even wealthier in a sense. Yeah. yeah. So with your, um, I want to talk a little bit about how you're saving because obviously, you know, you're saying, um, this to year 2019, you were able to save, you know, about $130,000. And that is amazing. <laughs> and in, 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 in some ways, at least, especially for maybe here, us in California, we're like, what? That is intense. <laughs> you know, how do you uh, actually go up to that point where you're able to really save a big chunk of your income? And like, what do you do to be able to 
have that mindset that you are going to save this much this year? Well, I guess um, around 2012, I was formulating one of my mad scientist plans on a spreadsheet. And I, I just realized that if I were able to max out all my tax advantage buckets, that that would be a considerable sum. And I also realized it would also greatly reduce my taxable income. So I'd pay very little in tax and I would put a whole bunch of money as I'm famous for saying my side of the ledger. I'm mm. always about like putting money to my accounts because mm -hmm. that's mine. Um, and we all know, like we just mentioned, there are people that they, they don't do that. So it, it just, it's like water through their fingers. So I, I just became almost, uh, almost pathologically pre-tax. I want to fill up all those pre-tax buckets mm -hmm. because I know I get a, a double bang out of that, you know, lower taxes, more assets saved. But then I, I guess 2012 is we actually quit our jobs and took a, a different job with that in mind. And we actually, this is a very important part. We actually followed through on that plan mm -hmm. and we filled in the, mm -hmm. filled all those buckets for three straight years. And in three years we saved $250,000. Wow. Okay. And, and keep in mind, this is, we were under 50. And as we've gotten over 50, that means we, those buckets have gotten even bigger. Mm. So, um, yeah, I wasn't able to hammer all those buckets right off the bat. Uh, truth be told, that was a missed opportunity for us back in uh, 2003. I didn't understand about that 457 bucket had I filled it. Mm. You know, I had $80,000 behind me and I was living in a $650 apartment. I mean, if I really had no, had a good, a better plan, you know, it's this pre fire movement and all that. Yeah. Um, I think I probably could have hammered those accounts for about seven years, five, five to seven years. And I would have been in a really enviable position, but that this was a play. This was an unknown playbook mm -hmm. back then. Essentially. Yeah. yeah. So I'm still getting written right now too. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess my point is, is that if you're in a position right now where you have a job that, that you have these buckets you can fill and you have some money, like in the form of savings that, that you could tap, you could take that job, that money from your job and just defer it and blow up your accounts. And, um, you know, right now in the, in the current state of the market, you might be picking up some uh, <laughs> lower, lower prices on your investments. I mean, I know I've, mm -hmm done a lot of uh, maneuvers here in the last three or four days. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, it, you got to be aware of what you can do. Right. And then at some point you got to do it. Um, and if you can't go a hundred percent in right off the bat, that's okay. You know, uh, in my case, it was somewhat gradual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about those buckets and just kind of, you know, give a little bit of uh, background on each of them? Yes. Um, well, it, most people are familiar with a 401k and that's probably what most people have. Now, mm -hmm. if you're a, a teacher or a public service employee, you're, you're going to have a 403B mm -hmm. more than likely. And that's analogous to a 401K. Now, public service employees and, and, and educators um, often have a 457 as well, the deferred comp plan. And 403B and 457, they're not, um, the contributions are not coordinated, which means you can fill them both up, all right? And so, you know, um, firemen, policemen, uh, county government employees, teachers, we're not known as like making the biggest bucks, but, you know, it's kind of ironic that we have this, this savings advantage in a sense. <laughs> so I, I get it. You're not, you don't have money shooting out your pocket, $100 bills falling out. But if you can find the way to fill these buckets, those two buckets in particular, it can be um, quite a bit of savings. In addition to um, the 403B or a 401k, you know, those, those are the two that generally people have. And that 457, you also have access generally to an IRA, individual retirement account. Mm -hmm. All right. And the case, uh, I, I, let's see, what is it? $6,000 a year you can do. 2020 and being that my wife and I are over 50 years old, we can do another thousand. So that's 7,000 for us times two. So that's 14,000 more dollars. And um, so that's the third bucket that we use. And the fourth bucket would be the health savings account. We use a high deductible healthcare plan since we're all healthy. 
Um, and that allows us to put another $8,100 away this year. Uh, and it, so that comes right off our tax as well. So just to give you an idea, our two IRAs and the health savings account, that is $22,100. Mm. All right. And our 403B 457 buckets, that is, make sure I'm telling you right, I believe that's $104,000. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. So, you know, that, that, <laughs> that that's considerable. That's six figures that you can make disappear. Um, and even if you're not over 50, um, what is it? 19.5, I believe. So what's that? 39. And if you're married, that'd be doubled. So mm. I don't want to go on the, it's kind of confusing doing numbers like that, but I mean, a, a married teaching couple has access to, a, if not a hundred, a little shy of that. I'd have to get mm. a pen and paper out. Mm. And, wow. and that'd be a lot of lot big buckets to fill. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. That's, those are really, really good nuggets. Just, you know, again, we have like probably, we have a lot of friends who are teachers. So <laughs> if, you know, this is an encouragement for everyone listening out there who are teachers that, you know, these are buckets that are actually available out there. And it's, it is funny. You're saying how ironic it is that teachers probably, you know, don't make the, the ones that don't make the most yet. There's this advantage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I know people in the private sector say, boy, I wish I had access to that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would. I'd want that too. Now, um, can I just put a caveat in there real quick? Yeah. That j- just be aware that um, 403bs are probably the most expensive investment plans in the nation. Mm. Uh, the average expense is 2.25 percent. Mm. So dig deep and ask very uncomfortable questions about what is this costing me? Mm. I've noticed they, uh, when you're dealing with uh, the, the providers of these plans, they never mention costs. Mm-hmm. You have to ask about it and uh, just assume they're high right off the bat, no matter how much you like the people you're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. I've never met a disagreeable person that is in this role, mm-hmm. um, but know what your, what your investments are costing. And I would stay away from any plan that charges surrender fees. Mm-hmm. All right. That me personally, just because I, I philosophically, I'm opposed to paying 5% of my money to move my money because yeah. at the end of the day, I don't care what they think. It's my money. Right. right. Yeah. Right. That's good to know. Now, um, being that we're in the middle of the, you know, the coronavirus and the markets and stuff are are okay. tanking kind of <laughs> left and right here. Um, I know that you have quite a bit in the in the market currently. Um, what are some strategies people who are looking to get into the market can can use? And then for those that are already in, what what should they be kind of looking at in terms of kind of avoiding any kind of huge or, well, lessen any kind of uh, loss that they might be facing? Well, I, I would have to say my advantage in this scenario is I lived through 2008, mm-hmm. and I remember watching about $60,000 evaporate in a day, you know, and I was just like, wow. And it makes you kind of question all your assumptions about investing. You know, uh, you think you know your risk tolerance, but, you know, doing that little survey online or in a piece of paper and then living through it is two different realities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I would just remind people of this. You have the same amount of shares today as you did last week. And don't lose sight of that. Um, and back in 2008, I didn't, I actually bought $10,000 more than I had. I had some cash. And you know that, that I took a big gulp before I pressed that submit button because it just, when you're in the moment, everything seems like, end of the world right mm-hmm. and i've had those swings this week like everyone else um so i would i would say me personally I, i'm opposed to being in this type of a scenario and locking in my loss i don't want to pull everything out of the market because you know i've got to then wait for the market to hit its bottom and know that and then reinvest mm-hmm. and if you're able to do that and you have a formula for that more power to you but you, you know you've got to get out at the right time and you got to get back in at the right time. And that's very hard to do. Of course, you, of course, in retrospect, it's very easy to do. You yeah. just go look at the price charts. But um, so here's what I've been doing this past week. Um, I, I guess the VTSAX was around $84, the Vanguard total stock market. Mm-hmm. And it dropped. And I, I'm trying to remember when I got in. I, I did, I did uh, Roth conversions essentially, where I, I move money from my traditional account to my Roth. Mm-hmm. Right. So 
later on. I, it'll be tax free. But I, I've done some, I guess, four days in a row. I've moved, my wife and I have moved about $33,000 over. Mm -hmm. And I think we, one day we got it at $70 a share and then 58 and then 56. <laughs> you know, you're not going to nail it perfectly, but you know, good, thank God we don't have to do everything perfectly in life. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to move those over to a, a, a more tax advantage account at a lower price because that means I get more shares over. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I haven't done all the converting I'd like to do this year, but I'm also, you know, waiting to see if any, if it gets more volatile. Yeah. Um, 33. That's, that's pretty good. I don't know how much more I will do um, because I, I don't want that, that, that money is taxable. Correct. And um, you know, I don't like paying tons and tons of tax, you know, so I'll do that with the, my tax pain threshold in mind. Um, something else I would tell people to do, you know, even if you're not investing now, I would say get a small account with Fidelity or Schwab and just start putting money in because this, you need to learn the lesson of volatility mm -hmm. and you need to live through some of these tumultuous times to where, you know, I put $10 in yesterday as were they, you know, well, okay, don't freak out, put another couple of bucks in whatever, and just kind of see how that progresses because mm -hmm. if you take your lumps and go through this, it, it makes you a stronger investor down the road. Yeah. Um, and and it, it just, you, I would, I always tell my students, look, you need an account just so you can experience this because when you're 30 and you have more money in, you don't want to be, you know, locking in your losses. Um, right. So right. Um, that that's an, the other thing I did during this time, I had some kind of idle cash in some of my accounts and I rolled some of that over and, and bought while the market was a little low. And then I've been like uh, scrounging for eight, like savings accounts that I have online, five bucks, 10 bucks here. And I send it all to my little Schwab account. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's all you can do. Um, I've even gone as far as dance with the devil. And what I mean by that is I have a, what I deem a high expense, 403b we mm -hmm. have one choice basically yeah and um I, i'm investing in an index fund through them and a, a vanguard fund a life strategy fund a growth fund but you know my expense ratios are 129 basis points and 139 mm -hmm. and i'm getting i would argue i'm getting no value added because i already know what i want to do mm -hmm. so you know if i were to, to go by myself um, to, to a company, I could pay four basis points for the index fund or even less. Right, yeah. Or if right. I go went to Vanguard directly, I'd pay 14 basis points. Mm -hmm. So because the market is so low at this point, or at least that's what it appears to be, you know, it could go lower. I've kind of jumped in with some of that money because I had a, a big cash position. Yeah. Wow. And I've only done $6,000, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I really it's, sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking because a lot of the listeners sometimes, you know, if you're if you're new in the game, you worry or you think like um, you don't have the um, you don't have uh, enough money to put in. But as you're saying you're talking like 14, 15 bucks just to get started, you know, and every little bit counts. Oh. Oh yeah. Um, well, I mean, at, at Fidelity and Schwab, uh, maybe I'm wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure they have no minimums. Like you could start an account for a dollar. Right. And, right. And, yeah. And then what, what I was referring to the, the 14 was the 14 basis points, right. the fees. Mm -hmm. Those are, that's, you know, four to 14. Those are pretty low. Right. Yeah. So my, my thing is the big impediment for many people is just opening the account. Right. You know, cause you've never been on those sites and, and you freak out. Once you get those open and you get your bank account attached to it where you can send some money over, well, now you, you can experience the magic, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. But if you don't have those accounts open, you can't invest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know a lot of people, that's their problem. They don't have anything open. They don't know what to do. Yeah. The first step is pretty much like you open the account. You know, you find, an, you find um, a place where you can open an account that doesn't have minimums. And, or if you have, you know, some money to put in, then you can obviously meet a minimum if there is one. Mm -hmm. um, but what I really, really love, like just kind of the nugget that I feel like I want to really reiterate to our audience is how you said, you know, if you can go through a down market like this 
and come out and you experience it. It really does make you a stronger investment later down the road. And I think essentially that's what we want to do as people who are always wanting to grow in, not just in, in the financial independence space, but just in life in general. We have to experience the bottom parts. We have to experience what that feels like because it is in feeling, you know, the what feels like the end of the world <laughs> and how scary it is that you put in, you know, when you're saying, oh, put in 10 tomorrow, it's only now worth $8. But how about those people that, you know, again, like you're, you're like, oh, I put in a hundred and now it's worth 40 grand or whatever. Right, <laughs> you know? right. and, and so I think it's really, really important for us to be able to go through the ups and the downs to make us just better investors down the road. So that's really awesome. Well, let, let me illustrate that point as, um, Last podcast I did, which wasn't that long ago, maybe four weeks ago, uh, my net worth was almost 1.6 million. Mm -hmm. I was creeping up on that. I was like, oh, woohoo. <laughs> and now today it's under 1.2. But really, at the end of the day, like I said, it's, I've got the same amount of shares. But you know, once you've kind of gone, gone through that, you, you understand that better. And it also makes you understand the following. When I was in Mexico in 2017, 18, we spent a year there. Um, we'd started about, we were in the second year of not working. We took two years off, my wife and I. So we're in the second year of not working. Our portfolio went from 1 million to 1.2 million without working. Hmm. But I remember thinking to myself, yeah, you're not a smart guy. It's not, it's just the market. <laughs> and so don't, you know, don't start counting your chickens before they hatch, right. you know, <laughs> you're not a genius. And right now you're not an idiot. It's just, you're, you're in the market and that's mm -hmm. the reality. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think with, um, the way that the market is right now and with a lot of the orders of people getting shut in, um, you know, people could take the time right now and like open up and or look at what it takes to open up an account. And basically what people sometimes don't realize is that, you know, right now when things are down, you're buying at a discount and for, for a, a lot of different scenarios. And then um, just like you said, with the, the, if you're looking at the long game, you know, this, this is a great time to, to start and to get in and to really focus because, you know, 10 years from now, eight years from now, that $8, $10 you put in, it's going to be, you know, who more. knows? It's going to be a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Fu future you will be very happy. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, for those that are listening, what, what would be some, I, I mean, your website, the millionaire educators has a ton of different recommended, you know, websites in that, but do you have any maybe favorite, favorite places or maybe ease of entry places that the listeners could jump into to get started? Oh, as far as investment firms? Correct. Oh, yes. Um, well, you probably hear a lot of people in the fire space talk about Vanguard. And the reason I haven't mentioned them is generally they have a $1,000 or $3,000 minimums. Mm -hmm. So if you're not quite ready to do that yet, and, and I'll, you know, full disclosure, most of my money's at Vanguard. Um, you have other options as well. You, you have um, Fidelity has some um, low cost funds that was no, no uh, minimum. Um, you also have Schwab, the same thing. Um, I believe Schwab bought TD Ameritrade. They have some, they had some very uh, cost-effective investments. So, but I always find myself talking to my buddies about using Fidelity or Schwab just because mm -hmm. I, I like their total stock market index funds and Fidelity has one that they're not even charging uh, a fee on. I don't mm -hmm. know what their business model is down the road. Probably going to try to upsell you some service, but you can get, it's not, a full match of the total stock market, but it's certainly close enough in my eyes. F Z R O X. Mm. Um, you know, that's total U S stock market. And the, the reason I like those type of funds is that you're betting on commerce, um, capitalism in a sense. And right now it, it seems like we're having some problems as a country, but at the end of the day, I think um, Apple, Google, McDonald's, Wendy's, Walmart, all these companies are going to be around. Yeah. And I hate to try to envision a future where they aren't. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I'm betting on is that we're going to have um, businesses producing things for us. Yeah. So you, that's what you're, when you buy those funds, that's what you're getting into. Um, total U S stock market. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> I wanted to kind of explore um, just, you know, obviously you've had this journey of uh, pursuing financial independence, independence like in your 30s and now that you're in your 50s. How has your picture or, you know, kind of like your idea of wealth evolved throughout that time period as well? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I guess I thought it would change me a lot but it really didn't. What it, the biggest thing about wealth and just having a little money behind you, it takes away a lot of those money pressures. Mm -hmm. And so you don't think about money all the time. You know, if you're strapped for cash, money's a, constantly at the front of your brain. Well, that's to me the beauty of, of financial independence and wealth building in general is that you can kind of put money on the back burner where it belongs because there's so much more to life than worrying about money. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a 14 year old son. And, and since he was little, we always would hammer that home to him about, you know, are there things more important in the world than money? And he was like, yes, we'd make him say, them, you know, like family and friends and faith and community. And, you know, he'll do, he can rattle those things off. But then we circle back around. We always tell him, but why is money important? And he can tell you, if you don't get the money piece right, money can ruin your life. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of the, the crazy thing about money. Once you kind of master some concepts, you put money to work for you. But if not, you'll be chasing dollars your whole life. Mm -hmm. You'll be working when you don't want to. Yeah. Maybe in jobs you hate. I mean, that, unfortunately, I know a lot of people like that. And um, it, that can be avoided with m proper money management. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you have um, maybe three... I don't know, maybe it doesn't have to be three, but a couple of like starter tips for people who are looking at. Um, yeah, well, actually, I, I was thinking about some of those things. Um, one of my blogs that I, I like to read, and he's got millionaire profiles, but what I like most about the blog is the title, ESI Money, because he, he gets right to it. Earn, save, and invest. Mm -hmm. that, that is the magic formula. And if you're not doing all three of those things, it's not enough. You have to obviously go out and earn money. Most mm -hmm. people do that. Save money. Well, yeah, you got to save it, but yeah, that's not the end of the story because you can't just park it in a bank account and get what 0.1%. That's not going to make you wealthy. <laughs> um, and then investing, you've got to invest that money, whether it be, you know, in, the, in mutual funds, the stock market, um, real estate, mm -hmm. there are many ways to skin that cat, but you, you know, you need to understand how to invest and, and, mm -hmm. And I, you know, being that I use um, mutual funds, you've heard me talk about it, it, it's got to be in a cost effective manner. Right. You know, you've got to make sure that return is making it to you, not the middleman. So um, it's important that you understand that, that, that uh, combination, earn, save, and invest. If you're just doing two of those, it's incomplete. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, second thing I would recommend is I would tell people to learn to live not below your means, but way below your means. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, well, it's happened now, hasn't it? Uh, if, when the fit hits the shan, you'll be ready. <laughs> um, but, you know, already we're hearing talk. I think they're talking of $1,000 stimulus checks going out to people. Right. Uh, you know, most people, they're on the edge. I think I saw, what, 78% are paycheck to paycheck in mm -hmm. America. Uh, with all the money that goes around here in the States, um, it shouldn't be that way. And, Really, at the end of the day, what does a thousand dollar check do for an adult? Yeah, you know, uh, my my concern is that we're going to give all adults a thousand dollars, and then we'll have trillion dollar bailouts. Yeah. <laughs> well, what? Let's flip that. You yeah. know, um, but anyway, you get my point. It's just like if if you learn to live frugally, I often say low on the hog. Um, you know, keep your structural costs low, which you know, uh, housing, transportation, food. Mm -hmm. But keep your cell phone, your, your internet, and your, your, um, your cable, all that, and check. It doesn't really cost a lot to live in America. It, it can be very, you know, inexpensive. You know, it's not free, but you, you've got it under control. So, um, and that's, that's one of the reasons we actually moved to where we moved. It's a low-cost part of the country that we like, mm -hmm. and we bought our $68,000 home. Mm -hmm. um, I had another thing I wanted to mention here. Where is it? Oh, and this is totally unrelated to money. Uh, but it's wealthy living in my, in a sense, you know, you need to, um, 
it depends on where you are, recover, maintain, or improve your fitness, okay? Because um, part of, of wealth is, is having your health. It doesn't matter, you know, I could, if I give you a trillion dollars, but I give you terminal cancer, uh, at the same time, what are you gonna take? Uh, you keep your trillion. Um, you you got to keep that. And the thing that's pretty incredible about that is no matter where you are in the spectrum, you can really improve your health dramatically. Um, more, more than you probably realize. Um, with uh, You modify your diet and your eating habits, um, some exercise, natural light, fresh air, uh, throw in some weight training or calisthenics. Holy cow. It's, um, it's shocking. And I say that as a person who in 2011, I lost 30, 35 pounds and I kept it off wow. and yeah. I, I run every day. I'm on a streak of almost 1400 days without a miss. And I do push. Oh yeah, I was just going to mention that because I'm looking at my notes right now and it says you passed 1200 straight days of jogging, but you're now at about 1400. Yeah. I'm, I'm creeping up on that. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, but you know, and I always, I, I love to be in the weight room with my basketball players and we're lifting and they'll come up there. Coach, how old are you again? Because, you know, they think that you're supposed to wheel me over the corner and, and change my yeah. rule bucket. <laughs> uh, but, but um, and, and I, I, you know, like walking around is no problem. You know, my flexibility is better, my, and it, but it improves your mood. Mm -hmm. um, just gives you a different outlook on life. And I also want to mention on a similar vein is that you also need to, like, um, go, go back to your hobbies and interests and poke around there because – you know, one day when you're not having to work all the time, how are you going to fill your days and your hours? Yeah. You know, um, hobbies are just kind of almost ridiculed now in the West because it's like, oh, you should be doing something productive. But, you know, uh, I, I disagree with that. I, I, I have a lot of things I'm interested in and I have time to read about them or write about them or go, go explore them. Um, but, you know, I know people who once they've stopped working, they don't know what to do with themselves. Mm -hmm. It's very sad to me. Yeah. I really love um, just how you're mentioning what you're basically saying is you're living, you're really passionate about living this whole life. You know, you're getting the money piece, right? I love how you teach your son because it is true. It is not about life. It's not about the money. You know, there's so much more in life than the money. However, the money piece is really, really, really important. And so you're saying, get the money piece, right? get your health in order. And when you do that, you actually become a lot more freer to be of service to your family, to your community. You have, you become basically a solution, you know, like when there's problems happening around the world, you're not worried about how you're going to survive yourself because you know that you already have taken care of those really important pieces and you free yourself and you have more time to be able to actually help other people and, you know, be there for your family and, and for your community. So that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's kind of hard to help people sometimes if you're not in a good spot. Yeah. And I, you know, I see a lot of people with um, compassionate hearts giving so much, but they neglect their, their own situation. Right. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I don't mean this in a selfish way. I mean, but uh, more of a self interest, you need to make sure that you're in a good spot because you don't want to be a burden down the road. Yeah. And you know, mm -hmm. down the road will, will come eventually. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, I, 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 being that I'm 56 now, I'm at a point in my life where I'm starting to see many people's bad decisions catch up to them. And, um, but, you know, and I, I've heard stories from people in the past I couldn't relate. Well, now I can really relate. So, you know, get yourself squared away um, so that you can be not a burden, financial burden on somebody, but you can be a benefit. You know, you'll yeah. be able to share your knowledge and maybe even your resources. Right. Mm -hmm. There's an awesome uh, proverb that I like about the ant and the grasshopper where the ant is like storing things over and over again. And the grasshopper is just like living life and going all over the place. And uh, <laughs> not that, you know, you do want to live life. And I think there's like kind of a medium there to, to a degree, but you know, when, when the winter hits, you know, or when, you know, a virus hits, <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you want to have something in the hopper or something in, in, in a space where you can provide for others, but also just, you, like you said, like you got to be able to take care of yourself to be able to take care of others. Yeah. And I love, I think you guys are very balanced too. Like I've seen your blog and when I, like you guys travel, like it's fun to see how you guys, you know, just again, just a very 
um, like full and fun life, you know, and at the same time, like really not be worried about money. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Well, you know, that year in Mexico, people say, how can you afford to take a year off? Well, I, and I, you know, I still haven't written this up yet, but I've got the spreadsheet. I, I, <laughs> it costs $23,000 for the year. Wow. My, my son's bilingual school, our apartment, everything, meals <laughs> out, trips, 23,000 bucks. It just blows my mind still. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Where else um, uh, do you, I mean, I know you, you teach and then uh, you, do you still coach? I, I was the head coach this past year. We had a coaching change and they won. They asked me if I would take over and um, I, I did. And <laughs> we, the year before we were, we didn't win a game and we won three games this past year. But at one point we were sitting at three and three. Oof. And then two of those other games, we actually were in those games and everybody, you know, I was like Mike Krzyzewski here in the community. Then we reeled off a lot of losses, but I, my guys really improved a lot. It was a lot of fun. Mm, fun. I was just so, so glad we got the monkey off our back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What other areas of the community are you passionate about, like giving into or serving? You know, being that we're, we're teachers, we, we kind of feel that that is a big connection to the community. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I don't know when it happened. And when I first started teaching, I, I, I taught just because it was a job and I could stay involved with my Spanish interest. Mm -hmm. But at some point, I just really liked the kids more. And mm -hmm. I almost feel like an uncle with thousands of nephews and nieces. Mm -hmm. And it's really kind of, a, I never anticipated that in my mind. But I, I just have really good rapport with the kids. And I, I tried to seed them with, um, you know, work ethic and mm -hmm. just, let them understand it's a big world. And at this point in their life, they have so much opportunity yeah. and I see their talents that they might not see. And I try to explain that to them yeah. mm -hmm. um, that, you know, I, there were points in my life. I was not a good student, you know, mm -hmm. in college, but that's okay. You can, you can write the ship and, 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 and become something. So I'm always nurturing them in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, anything I do with coaching, um, even like I do like some of the weight room training occasionally and I get to meet students in a different realm. Like uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had a couple of the uh, softball players, a couple of four or five girls. And then they don't really know me, you know, too well, but we were doing Pilates and I had them doing kettlebell swings. And next day they come up to me like, coach, holy cow, my glutes are so sore. I'm like, great. That's the way we do it. <laughs> you know? And, and but you could see like a little spark going off and they're like, you know, and then when well, they couldn't come work out one day, they, they all made sure they came and told me why they couldn't be there. And yeah. so I, I just like, I feel like I, I've got a connection with a lot of people here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and, and I'll truth be told, this is the second time we've been here. We live in Statenville, Georgia, Eccles County, 4,500 people in the, in the community, uh, mostly woods, but um, we chose to come back here. This is, um, probably our favorite teaching spot ever. We've had good ones before, but this place was special to us just because it's got such a small town feel, excellent schools, mm -hmm. friendly people. And uh, you said there's a bunch of woods around. Is that uh, for some of your Sasquatch? Uh, yeah, well, this, this, you know, I see you listen to the podcast. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was on the Confessionals podcast because uh, I've just, I relayed the various South Georgia Sasquatch stories I've gotten over the years here from the locals. If for whatever reason, well, the reason is I like to talk and I can get people to open up, but people have just confided in me their stories or things they've heard from mm -hmm. like family members. And then I, of course, I had a little sheet open on Google and I was typing them out and it just, just so many. And these are normal, <laughs> normal people, you yeah. know, like one lady, I was, she was from the church and just got, you know, kids in our school. I thought this is quite a tall tale if this lady's lying and, and, uh, I don't know. There's just so many stories like that. It's kind of mind blowing because a lot of people think of like Bigfoot Sasquatch as mm -hmm. North Pacific Northwest thing generally. But then when you start, mm -hmm. you get out in these rural areas and you start talking to people and they'll start telling you stuff. And you're like, wow, that's crazy. Or yeah. maybe they all have conspired to just tell you <laughs> the same yeah. story. I'm just <laughs> or, <laughs> or, I, <laughs> or it's maybe it's just part of the military psy psyops to, keep us all distracted yeah <laughs> my, uh, 
Yeah, we. I'm I'm from a small town up in upstate New York called Kendall, and we have like cornfields and cabbage all around. My brother and um, my best friend swear to this day, and they tell the same story, which is that's kind of like, all right, how could they both be lying? But they said they saw something that was like kind of like lurching around. They say they call it pumpkin head, like that horror. Yeah. 80s. They said they saw that walk in, but it was like above the cornfields, and it walked down into like the tree lines, and just kind of disappeared. Um, but yeah, there's always these weird stories. Yeah, we're way off topic, but I just wanted to jump yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know there's a lot of stories from up there. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, what's one of those things that uh, I, I guess until you see one, you're not going to believe it. It just sounds right. insane. I remember a blog post about that. I don't know if you guys stumbled across that, but it, it's beyond the realm of imagination of most people, mm -hmm. as is the whole talk of fire. Right. Like, yeah, what do you mean? Exactly. You could work seven years and be retired? Well, yeah, if you have a plan, you actually work it. But mm -hmm. certainly with 10 to 15, if you know what you're doing. Yeah. And the, who tell, you know, that makes me a crazy man to some people to talk like that. Well, you start talking about a, a seven to eight foot hairy primate, you, you're in the same realm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people are going to be, they're going to believe what they, what they believe. And Bigfoot and I have it. the same. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that blog post actually made the front of um, Rockstar Finance. Yeah, <laughs> and that was really cool. Of course, I was so excited about that. Right, right. It's amazing. It's just awesome because like that is such a good analogy because I know like in my, you know, my, my work circles, sometimes we start talking about like, you know, just the, the freedom or the, of, the ability to, you know, purchase like homes or real estate or um, just different levels of uh, investments and where, where some of the, our, our net worth has been going. It's just like, you know, they, they can't really, they can't see it because they haven't gone through it, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, right. it's, it's breaking things down into little kind of baby steps almost to get, to get the, everybody to, to understand and to start really thinking about their own personal finance and really start making the moves towards that. It's, and it's, it's a, a, it's a shift. yeah, that's what it is. It's just like a shift in your mind. You know, it has to shift because if you don't shift, obviously, you know, like you'll never get out of, um, you know, where you've been this whole time, you know? So, so it is definitely, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have my perspective shift about a Bigfoot. So. <laughs> 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 uh, I'll send you some links. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe yeah. I'll get like a paradigm shift all of a sudden. <laughs> all right. Well, is, this has been such a pleasure. I really, we really, really love chatting with you. Um, just to close it out, uh, we kind of want to know what your three actionable tips. I know we touched a little bit and you have you've already given so many good things, um, but just three quick short tips that you want to share with our guests for them to be able to live their wildly wealthy life. Um, number one, Learn to become a hardcore saver. Get serious about saving your money and investing it. Um, two, cultivate a awesome frugal lifestyle that you like, where you like your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last thing is, I would say, maintain your fitness and 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 cultivate those interests because that should be a bigger part of most people's lives. And most mm -hmm. people, it's the you know the drudgery. That's what they're doing. You know, because I don't care what your job is. At some point, it gets stale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Perfect. Agreed. Awesome. I love that. Okay. We are now on our quick 10 rapid fire questions. These are 10 questions we ask all our guests. We ask you to say the first thing that comes to your mind. Don't censor yourself. We'll keep it quick and concise. Some of them are questions related to our podcast theme, and some of them are just fun things we want to know about our guests. So are you ready? Yes. <laughs> okay. Number one, if you could choose one book to live by, what would it be? Okay, I'm not going to filter myself. The first thing that popped in my head was uh, cashing in on the American dream, how to retire at 35. Nice. Uh, your personal hero, living, deceased, someone you know or maybe don't know. Oh, uh, John Bogle springs to mind. Um, okay. Yeah, he, he, he could have been a billionaire, but he chose to make millions of people millionaires. Wow, that's awesome. Number three, the one thing you intentionally have to do every single day. put on my running shoes have to do it if not I, my day is off to a bad start okay. mm -hmm. uh one hobby that brings you the most joy mm, hobby that brings me the most i guess probably foreign language study 
uh, on Duolingo, and it, it keeps me humble because I, you never know all of a foreign language, and some of them you just you just flat out suck at. I I look German, but my German's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number five, most rewarding thing you've done for someone in need. Oh, let's see. Um, bought hotel rooms for uh, family members at a at a wedding. Mm. Yeah, we just had the ability to do it, so we did it. That's yeah, that's awesome. awesome. Uh, first movie quote that pops in your head. Oh gosh, um, uh, first movie quote. Um, oh wait, I'm some about the, you can't stand the truth. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was that John Nicholson? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of things that when the truth gets there, people just don't want to hear it. Exactly. <laughs> just yeah. like fire and big foot. All right. Go way back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, number seven, last big purchase you made for yourself. We bought our first flat screen TV a couple months ago. We didn't have a TV for a couple of years. We bought one. Nope. Nice. Awesome. Nice. Um, a food you cannot live without. Number eight. Blue cheese. Blue cheese. <laughs> I love blue cheese. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, very specific. Number nine, what is your spirit animal? Spirit animal. Um, uh, wild stallion. Very specific. <laughs> it's not just, you know, <laughs> any stallion. It's the wild stallion. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Let it rest. All right. And number 10, the last one. Finish the sentence. If I'm stuck in an island by myself, We'll be having coconuts for dinner. <laughs> Perfect. I love that. Love it. <laughs> you and I will be good friends because I love coconuts. Or maybe oh, not. Yeah. We're just going to be fighting over it. <laughs> Hopefully, if we're in an island, there's a lot of coconuts. So we don't yes. <laughs> well, I know in the tropics, they got lots of them. <laughs> All right. Well, it's been a pleasure, Jerry. Thank you so much for joining us today. Where can I guess... Uh, guests find out more about you N not guests oh my goodness where can our listeners find out more about you and if there's anything that you would like our listeners to encourage to give into or serve into what would that be well if you're looking for me you can find me at millionaireeducator.com um, and I also have my, my twitter handle is my old alias ed underscore mills underscore uh, I got away from that but um I'm easy to find. There's a small Facebook presence too, where I just link my infrequent blog posts. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to find me. Um, I, I guess the last thing I'd like to tell the listeners is when it comes to financial independence and other so-called impossible things, you might want to do a little, you might want to check your, your mind, your, your, your mindset on that, those subjects, mm -hmm. because a lot of things that you assume are impossible, they're not. Okay thing is it might take a, a, a little plan a little execution of the plan but the first thing is you got to change the way you, you you mentally think about things that is a big uh, uh step in any success and that's the kind of thing if i heard years ago i would have just poo pooed that i was like that's that's too you know for lack of a better term too artsy fartsy for me because mm -hmm. i'm more of a doer mm -hmm. but yeah you you, you got to kind of just Think about how you can do things and then get your plan of attack and follow through. You'll, you'll probably surprise yourself. Awesome. Thank like you. That a lot. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Jerry. It's been really fun. Yeah. You have any exciting Thanks. questions for the day? Um, well, we're here quarantined, so we'll probably go for a walk at about six o'clock. Um, then uh, we'll, we'll cook some dinner and we'll break out some red wine here before you know it. It is Saturday night after all. Right. <laughs> and then being that it's Saturday night, we'll all have to take a, a shower for first of the week so we can go to church tomorrow. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Once a week shower, just before church. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> well, this quarantine living is very similar to a lot of fire living. So if <laughs> you don't know what to do with your time. You might not want to like, you might want to skip the RE part of fire. <laughs> yeah. I'll leave y'all with that. Just be financially independent. You don't have to retire early. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to. Totally optional. Yeah. Perfect. Well, well thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you Best of luck with your podcast. I cannot wait to, to listen to your guests. Awesome. Thank you.
And next week, we have Monique Kam, who I am super excited to see, as my wife has met her a couple of different times. And I just love the networking and all of the real estate tidbits that she's able to share. My wife has grown so much just in the last six months. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, so make sure you check out her episode next week. She is my mentor, and she's a woman real estate investor, which I love. And if you were inspired by today's message, make sure that you at least share it with one person or two people that you know will be impacted by it. Go to iTunes and like and subscribe. It would help us out greatly. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Wildly Wealthy Life. We hope that this episode has helped you take another step towards living fully, giving freely, and building a legacy that deeply impacts your community. We'd love to hear what you think about today's show. Please leave us a review or like us on iTunes and YouTube, and click the subscribe button so you won't miss a show. You can also visit us at wildlywealthylife.com for today's show notes. See you on our next episode. Thank you, and may you live a wildly wealthy life.